this is, as uh, Greg mentioned, a kind of an expansion of the frugal modeler article that appeared in the most recent waybill of the Midwest region. And it's about coopering freight cars. Uh, the word cooper or coopering uh, takes its name from the trade, the art and the craft of, of making watertight barrels. And uh, uh, some of the same skills are involved, but in the case of coopering freight cars, um, uh, you've got uh, uh, several goals. One is to avoid um, leaking, of, uh, leaking of product from the car. The other is to stop the entrance of rain and moisture, also the entrance of dirt and the entrance of vermin, all of which can contaminate the load or the, uh, uh, or the packaging and cause a uh, damage claim against the railroad when the, uh, uh, when the product is received by the uh, recipient. Um, uh, the word cooper, coopering has been used for a long, long time in the railroad business. And, um, You'll see many references to it in uh, uh, in uh, at least certain older publications and uh, uh, railroad uh, railroad publications, not uh, not hobbyist publications. Um, we're going to start with something which isn't exactly coopering at all. Oh, uh, and I see that I'm not progressing uh, just as I feared. All right, hover hover toward the right side of that image and see if an arrow pops up over to the right there you go and down yeah to the like the middle the center. well all right now you got the menu that came up yeah, yeah. oh and no, oh. i yeah there you there go. go so um and now that has come back so now right, just, right click again on the big image yeah there you there go, go. Um, uh, coopering uh, really the era of wood cars was the heyday of coopering um, uh, both uh, both uh, 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 single sheathed and, uh, and double sheathed. Um, uh, these wooden cars basically spent their entire career uh, uh, shaking themselves to pieces uh, in, in uh, railroad operations. Uh, the, the, the nickname uh, for, for guys who checked on the conditions of cars in the yards was car knockers, because they'd go around with a wrench and just hit on various parts of the car. Yep. And things would be loose, usually indicating something had to be tightened, like a, a truss rod or parts of an arch bar truck. Uh, but the wood also kind of shook itself to bits. And um, uh, this practice of coopering began to seal up the gaps that, that would appear between uh, the pieces of wood. Uh, sometimes it would be the application of tar paper on the interior of the car. Sometimes it would be tar impregnated string sometimes just very large sheets of, of uh, craft paper. Um, the, the common theme is that most of those examples of coopering were inside the car and thus weren't something you could readily model. Although if you model this era, you could certainly have a, a, a track dedicated to uh, the coopering of cars because it was so common and so necessary. But uh, the focus of this presentation is going to be on more modern cars and also on forms of coopering that you can actually see and model. Um, and uh, I'm going to somewhat contradict myself by uh, giving as a first example something that really isn't true coopering, and that is um, uh, the damage to, uh, to uh, covered hopper uh, uh, trough hatches. Uh, they take a beating in uh, in normal work, uh, uh, and here are some fairly extreme examples. And I th I think you could readily see how anything in that covered hopper isn't going to stay particularly dry or particularly clean um, or uh, particularly free of dirt and vermin. Um, so it the the replacement of a uh, of a hatch uh, may not technically be coopering, but it's the same sort of light repair. Uh, that would take place on dedicated tracks in a in a busy rail yard where they can blue flag the car so that no engine will inadvertently move it while a guy is trying to do his work. If you go to a car shop, and I've had the chance to tour a few, you'll notice uh, enormous stacks of spare um, covered hopper hatches because, again, it's so common for them to suffer the kind of damage we uh, saw in those first few photos. 
So um, uh, a, a, a frugal model article uh, from several years ago talked about how do you model that kind of damage to uh, to uh, covered hopper trough hatches uh, because the, the plastic uh, castings on your model are way too thick uh, to have that uh, that look. Um, and uh, I, I followed the advice of a modeler named Bruce Petty who showed how to use the thick foil on the top of wine bottles and press it into, uh, in his case, he wanted um, uh, to take uh, uh, HO scale model vehicles and have open hoods or open trunks trunks, mm -hmm. and he would Im kind of emboss the foil into the model and make a replica of it. So you uh, you fasten your original in some way using tape, perhaps to a, maybe a block of wood. And then uh, using uh, uh, embossing tools, you take that foil and just uh, constantly rub it into the plastic casting. And after a while, it will take on the, the details of, of that casting. That's a, a burnishing tool, um, maybe not meant for model railroading, but it's a tester's uh, burnishing tool. Mm -hmm. I uh, actually also even use the cork from a wine bottle to kind of press the uh, foil into the uh, casting. You can see the casting to the right and the foil covering. Once you get a reasonably uh, good looking uh, version of the uh, casting in foil, uh, you cut it out with a sharp knife and, and holding it very carefully, you, you uh, file away the slightly rough, burry edges. I then turned it upside down because it formed a trough and filled it with white glue to give it some solidity so I could hold it more readily. And uh, modeled uh, a, if you will, a covered hopper that's in need of coopering. So this is a, a pre-coopering portion of the presentation. <laughs> So the two, um, the two leftward um, uh, hatches are replicas made of foil, mm. and the, the two rightward ones are, are original. And uh, they look reasonably similar. You could also use you know, this idea of the foil replicas to create those um, crates full of replacement hatches, because again, the, the, the plastic castings that come with the model are almost a scale foot thick. Uh, the next example uh, of coopering uh, in a modern context also deals with covered hoppers. Um, and that is uh, the use of a very thick sheet plastic uh, between the hatch and the uh, inner uh, rim of that hatch uh, so that the uh, seal is uh, superior. It's more waterproof, more dirt and uh, vermin proof. Uh, these uh, the sheets of plastic are used for round hatches, but also the trough hatches, as you see here. Actually, this is kind of an unusual hybrid hatch that combines the two. And you can kind of get a feel for just how thick that plastic is, the way it uh, uh, is distorted. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really model this very readily because we, uh, I don't know about other scales, but uh, in HO, typically our hatch castings are single piece. You don't really have a two-part hatch that you can open and close. Maybe we'll get there. Maybe we even are there. I don't know what the 3D printing guys are doing, but if, if you had the two-part hatch, then you could model it a lot more realistically mm -hmm. than I was able to. So what do you do for the plastic? Well, um, I used, because the goal of the Google Modeler articles is always to spend zero money if you can, or at least very little, uh, the glassine windows in an envelope. Now, genuine glassine is a, is a cellulose product, and I don't think anyone even puts it in envelopes anymore. So it's plastic. It's a, it's a thin plastic. And using that thin plastic, I tried to find ways uh, to kind of make it stick to the hatch casting so that it would look a little bit more like those photographs. And did, did I succeed? Not exactly. Uh, but again, it's partly because uh, we don't really have two-part hatches like the real ones where they have a uh, you know, a, a gasket that the hatch open and closes on. That looks good. 
Well, you know, these are extreme close-ups. Uh, if you actually see the model, you, you actually think I've replicated the look of that uh, sheet plastic. And on this one, you can hardly see it's there, but, but it is there. Mm. So that's, uh, a, 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 that, this would be actual coopering. Uh, maybe not from the standpoint of how the railroad employees would call it, but I think for our purposes, if it's to prevent the entrance of moisture, dirt, or vermin, uh, or to prevent the load from spilling out, uh, it's coopering. Um, these next few prototype photos were courtesy of Doug Harding. And I think he gave a presentation to this Zoom on uh, grain doors. I did, yes. And uh, you were kind enough to uh, let me uh, use these photos uh, for my own uh, frugal model article on grain doors. Um, in this particular case, if you look very closely, the grain doors are actually labeled uh, Fort Worth and Dodge. Um, and Fort Worth they, and Denver. Fort Worth and Denver. And they would be reused and uh, sent back uh, when the load arrives. Uh, yeah, the that, wood grain doors were owned by the railroads. And so mm -hmm. they wanted them returned and they would actually send boxcars out to the major terminals grain elevators to collect them and return them back so they could be reused. Mm -hmm. so. Now these particular um, Fort Worth and Denver uh, grain doors are what look like one, two, three, four uh, pieces of, of lumber. Uh, it does look like the second from the top is a slightly different size than the uh, other three. Um, that's a very tall grain door. This is a nice shot of a a UP that uh, looks like a rebuilt USRA car um, uh, with its grain door. And in the uh, Fugal model article that I wrote on grain doors, oh, uh, and I've also shown these images too. Uh, years ago when uh, uh, rail fanning in Scarborough, Illinois, where the tracks are long gone, that would have been the line that went south from Rockford through Davis Junction, through Rochelle, uh, through Stewart Junction and then down to Mendota. Uh, uh, that, those tracks are, are pulled up south of Rochelle, but I found a, a grain door next to a grain elevator, a Milwaukee Road grain door, um, and was able to take measurements. So it too is, is uh, stamped with the logo of its owner. And if you turn it over, you see how they're actually made with uh, the longer boards are on the other side, and then the, the shorter boards here, and then the, uh, the two verticals. And that's kind of how I found it. Um, so following uh, my frugal modeler goals of spending no money, I keep all the little odds and ends that are left over from constructing a laser cut kit and found appropriately shaped pieces of uh, wood. Um, I have a dial caliper that actually measures in HO scale uh, feet and inches. So I was able to create four inch wood, seven inch wood, six inch wood, eight inch wood, and kind of picked and chose what looked best or seemed closest to those uh, Milwaukee Road grain doors. <laughs> Because they were three, they were three board doors, and the proportions. I, I tried to measure the proportions off of the photos, and that uh, it was two big boards and one very small one. So here it is installed um, in a plastic boxcar. But this is typically the installation of grain doors is regarded as a form of coopering. Now, uh, uh, succeeding grain doors were the paper doors. Uh, which are also used in grain service. This is an example. This is on the Milwaukee Road's beer line. So this uh, this particular uh, boxcar was headed down to Schlitz or perhaps Pabst, um, loaded with grain. <coughs> these, however, while they look similar, they're not. These uh, boxcars were in wood chip service. And it's a slightly different arrangement. Here the boards cross the door entrance and then paper is, uh, behind the boards. That's not the classic signode grain door, but uh, but uh, paper and wood. So two boxcars in uh, wood chip service. 
And a lot of those wood chips came from South Dakota and uh, traveled all the way uh, over on the Northwestern into Wisconsin. Um, uh, this isn't really in a correct order for this uh, talking about coopering, but this is an ad for a grain door kit with uh, a mixture of wood and paper. Um, and you could get it in two sizes, 76 inches by uh, 90 inches or 70, 75 inches by 90 inches or 75 inches by 114 inches. So that would be really a wide door. Most grain doors that you grain, uh, wood grain doors you see were the, for the old six foot grain doors. Everything needed to cooper one car in a single convenient package. So uh, even this uh, ad refers to coopering, simplifies the entire coopering process. Here's a Signode um, door. Um, a, an outfit called Jaeger makes these in HO. Hmm. Now, um, succeeding and kind of eliminating the need for wood or paper grain doors were the plug door box cars, of which there was a special version um, intended for uh, grain use. Um, it had those two doors at the top. The, the plug door would kind of prevent the leaking of loads and also the entrance of dirt water or vermin. Uh, and those two little doors at the top were uh, for loading and also for grain inspection. And here was what Youngstown uh, claimed about their uh, uh, grain access flush doors. Uh, you'll save a lot of money in loss of grain and you'll save millions in coopering costs at, um, Atherin at one time uh, made a uh, car that had that ki kind of door pre-installed as part of the casting. They may still have it, I, I don't know. And interestingly, in around 1900, the Milwaukee Road had kind of the same idea with mm -hmm. these flush fitting uh, door. This is a grain car. Um, and uh, these flush fitting doors would serve somewhat of the same purpose. Um, uh, as a slide, as a uh, plug door, but they were hinged. I don't think anyone's ever made a model of this car. Um, now we're going to get to some of the coopering that I actually talked about in the frugal model or article that appeared in the most recent version of the Midwest Region Waybill at the uh, Sioux City, Iowa Railroad Museum that we toured as part of the Chicago Northwestern Historical Society meet. They had a uh, kind of modern uh, Chicago Northwestern waffle-sided boxcar. And uh, if you notice uh, to the left of the door, right below the ACI label, it has the word steam parts. This is the car that would have accompanied the 460 number 1385 in its goodwill tours all over the Chicago Northwestern system. And this is where they'd have spare parts. So once those tours stopped, this car uh, evidently uh, was never returned to other service and ended up at this museum. It seems kind of, kind of a modern car to be in a museum, but uh, Illinois Railroad Museum has some modern cars as well. My attention was drawn to the door because uh, this door had taken a beating. Um, it had holes, it had gouges, um, it had a lot of dents. I think uh, at some point someone had tried to use a fork lift trucks um, blades to uh, open, close, or unlock the door. Uh, and that's the kind of damage that can arise. So those holes need to be filled with uh, a putty uh, or other product. I, I, I said it looked a little like Bondo, and it may well be Bondo. And I suspect some of it has actually fallen away over the years, exposed to the weather, because most coopering was kind of a temporary thing. Uh, it wasn't ne necessarily meant to be long-term. It was meant to get one or two more loads safely shipped and then might have to be done all over again. So we'll look at these two things again. And uh, it was not really even modeling, but I, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, uh, I also found in my picture collection examples of boxcar doors that uh, had been taped with a, a pretty wide tape. Uh, obviously this is just what's left after the door has been opened and the tape mostly removed. But here's a couple of uh, examples of taped uh, freight car doors. 
So for modeling purposes, I just dabbed um, uh, uh, slightly uh, uh, off-white paint. I used one of those micro brushes, but th those dabs are way too big. They're big, much bigger than the prototype. I should have used the end of a toothpick. That would be closer to scale size. And um, I found some uh, examples of paper that was the same color as that tape, oddly enough, in a Micromark catalog. So I just uh, cut out the little illustration from that catalog, uh, glued it in place, and then distressed it with a wire brush so it doesn't look real pristine. And I, it, I installed both on the same car because I wanted uh, one picture. I'm only allotted so much uh, column space in the waybill, and I wanted one picture to show both ideas. This, in case um, it, it doesn't look familiar to you, this is an Atherin car, but back from when Atherin cars were all metal. And the doors were stamped, just like the real ones, and were scale uh, thickness. I have a number of these doors, and I have a number of Atherin metal cars, but I have even more of the doors. And uh, I kind of like the way they look. Mm -hmm. So I apologize for the oversized coopering uh, to the right. Uh, and, uh, and actually, of course, in neither case uh, was, was I dealing with a double door box car in, in the prototype, but I just wanted one car to, to serve uh, for my uh, allotted photograph in the, uh, in the waybill. Um, the next thing I showed in the waybill were overhead shots taken from a railroad bridge of uh, uh, modern boxcar roofs, which have been coopered. You know, these are separate panels and the panels are joined. And I would suspect that over time, the joins uh, loosen up with the shaking or bouncing of the car or, or hard coupling or things that happen in a hump yard and the, uh, and the seal fails and water gets into the car. So you see here that a, a, a caulk or a, a, a putty of some kind has been uh, slathered uh, onto the, uh, uh, where the, where the separate panels of the roof meet. Uh, here's another example. And it's also a good example of overspray on the uh, galvanized roof of a car because it's a, it's a yellow box car. So uh, I just kind of slathered on, uh, uh, again, slightly off-white acrylic paint, not greatly watered down, uh, covering the, uh, the same seams on a, a modern boxcar plastic freight car roof. I also found cars where they not only uh, uh, caulked or puttied up the, um, the, uh, between the pa roof panels, uh, but also where the roof panels meet the sides of the car. Here's uh, one example. And here's another. And as I said in the article, it's, it's obvious that neatness did not count when applying uh, that, that sealant. Uh, and uh, neatness didn't count. Oh, here's another example. Uh, and neatness didn't count in my model either. Um, and for some comic relief, um, I was uh, rail fanning with uh, Gordy Robinson, who some of you may have had the chance to meet. He's the president of the NMRA, and he's from the Orkney Islands in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And he pointed out uh, not only the very large dent in the roof of this boxcar, which was probably too dense and probably caused, again, by... Uh, a forgetful uh, uh, forklift operator who raised uh, the chassis too high and dented and possibly punctured um, the roof. Uh, but there was sealant in many large swaths of this roof and they left their brushes behind. <laughs> uh, so you could argue that the, the brush itself is a form of coopering. It's, it might be over one of the bigger uh, openings or gaps for all I know. So that also gives you a notion that the, the sealant that they used was not in tubes, uh, but rather in, uh, uh, in cans or in a, a heated pot. I don't, I don't know. 
it, it actually, this particular car it looks like there was an earlier attempt to Cooper where the uh, roof meets the uh, car sides. It's grown uh, kind of a rusty red uh, and may, may need to be done over again. But these are all effects that can be modeled. I don't know about the brushes in HO. Uh, you could sure try it. Uh, uh, I don't know what to say about this. This is from a tank car, but it clearly has been slathered um, with, with uh, some kind of uh, what looks like a, a, a sealant. Um, and, and it presumably had uh, leaking issues. I searched everywhere for the for my photo of the complete car, and I can't find it. And I know I have it somewhere, mm. uh, but this is what the and, and this isn't a, a really a classic tank car dome. Uh, uh, it might be a manhole uh, for entrance into the car, but obviously it must have leaked, and they needed to seal it up. You can yeah. see certainly see signs of rust on the hinges. Yeah, the valve control should be inside there. The valve control, okay. Are inside the uh, big. So you thing. lift up the lid, and there's. Yeah, uh, right, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that looks like it's what would be called a roof cement, which was kind of an asphalt mm -hmm. mixture that was painted on roofs to kind of seal up leaks and waterproof them, and it came in black and gray and kind of an off white, as I understand it. So this almost looks like it was smeared on with somebody's fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, probably used a large putty knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it is it is nonetheless an effect that can be modeled. Um, this isn't uh, coopering per se, uh, but if the, if the general subject of coopering mm -hmm. is leaking loads mm -hmm. or the entrance of dirt, water, or vermin, um, this would, this car um, uh, was obviously uh, very temporarily uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, dealt with so that it can at least uh, deliver that load, hopefully without the recipient rejecting it. Uh, and then something more uh, serious will have to be done about it. And that would, theoretically, that could be modeled. I don't know if I'll be doing a frugal model around that one or not. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, and on the subject of... <laughs> On the subject of leaking loads, uh, uh, I don't know if if what they would do to the uh, outlets at the bottom of a covered hopper would be uh, termed coopering, uh, but this car sure needs it. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. And uh, to conclude, uh, some cars are a little bit beyond <laughs> coopering. Uh, <laughs> so you, you wouldn't even, and there's no putty in the world that can uh, take care of that car. <laughs> Yeah. Not even for America's resourceful railroad. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, now says sourceful. Yeah, right. <laughs> sourceful. Yeah. Ill road. Yeah. Ill road. Ill road. And they were, and that, and they were ill about this time. Yeah, they were. Um, yeah. They were uh, 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 scrapping these on site, and uh, I was photographing these, and uh, a railroad cop came around and said, uh, I obviously have to tell you to leave the property. But he said, I can also tell you there's people living in some of these cars, and I think you would yeah. like to leave the property. <laughs> <laughs> you remember where this was? Yeah, it's uh, it was near um, uh, College Avenue. Um, oh, uh, you're kidding. Oh, yeah. that, that little yard north of between right. College and Grange. Right. right at Lake, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Lake Tower Yard. Yeah. So that's my presentation. All right. Well done, Dave. Thank you very much. And we still got Mitch. He's silent, but but he's here. Well done, Mitch. <laughs> we'll get the audio working next week for Mitch. So, Ron, there's 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 plenty of time for those photos that you said you wanted to show. Uh, if you want to see some uh, railroad uh, depots and so forth, uh, I'll bring it up. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let me uh, mm. try to figure out how to do it here. Okay. And I also just pulled up a full, few photos related to coopering of boxcars, if you mm. want to see that. So.
follow up with what Dave did. I won't yeah. use the same photos. <laughs> Can we see that? Yeah, let's see it, Doug. All right, this is on the uh, Milwaukee. Uh, Van Horn is a very small town uh, west of Cedar we're not, Rapids. We're not seeing your screen yet, Ron. Oh, you're not? No. Well, One that's more. interesting because I have it. I do have that screen. <laughs> I know the feeling. Does <laughs> 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 they work better? I don't know. <laughs> i go find out. There we go. So, That's better. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right. All right. Anyway, uh, Van Horn was is still a little, just a little burg out there in the middle of nowhere. But at one time, that was a division point wow. on the Milwaukee Railroad. That's quite a depot there. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to live a few miles from there. So, yeah. Oh, Here we see a <clears throat> uh, elevator, and this thing is the, on the bottom of the. I think it's probably a postcard indicating there was a wreck there, and uh, apparently it was right there at the depot. I love the passenger car. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. roundhouse at Van Horn, and that's a big roundhouse for. Wow. Uh, yeah. Of course, everything is totally gone now, but. It looks like it's brick. Sure. It does look brick. Yep. Or cut stone. I was I was gonna say I think it was cut stone, but it was a big complex. Yeah. Did you was it there when you were in that area? No, that was all long gone. I didn't know it existed until I saw some sandboard maps. Mm. So. What, what state is it? Iowa. Iowa. Oh, of course. Right yeah. west of Cedar Rapids. About yep. 20 miles, maybe. Okay. Yeah, that'd be about right because I was in Blairstown, which was about eight miles south of there. Yeah, it's north of 30, Highway 30. E correct. And this was the hotel that was there. And Sir Roof. Which was probably three stories high, probably wood. That's what the town looked like from the air. Had a couple of elevators. And a canning company. Sweet corn? I would assume sweet corn. Yep. What time frame? What years? Any idea on the canning photo? Canning I was... Probably about 1900 through the 30s or 40s. Yeah, that's about what I would say. This was, I, I found these pictures at the, the library and uh, scanned them uh, the best we could. And they asked somebody there was a dealer and obviously got a couple of steam uh, tractors. I don't know what kind those are, but... Uh, and here's a bad picture of them thrashing. Mm. Notice the old <laughs> truck over here for hauling the oats away. Mm -hmm. And here's a wagon. Can you go back one? Yeah, I go back one. I'm sorry. Thanks. Uh, those are Reeves. Mm. Okay. Or Kecks. Now they got they they got the uh, angle on the back. They may be a Keck. Anyway, cool shot. I think my son wagging up to get some more oats there with the horses pulling. So this dates back probably in the twenties mm. and thirties. That's quite having a small pile. Having a having truck to haul grain is pretty fancy too. Most of them just had old wood grain wagons at that time. You know that kind of that truck is probably about a twenty five or thirty or twenty five twenty eight. That may date this picture. There's another truck off to the uh, right. There is by the tractor. Yep. Yep. Fortunately, I have your pictures off to the right on mine. I that, by the way, is an Avery. Oh, yep. And that's a C cab something. That's 
this one here, the one on the right is really early. That's like in the yeah. teens. Yeah. That looks really old. <laughs> well, that wagon, I actually rode in one of them when they were, I was a kid where they were uh, shucking corn. Hmm. And pick corn by hand, just shucking, throwing it into a wood wagon. I have also. <coughs> And we get some better pictures here. This is Marshalltown. I uh, I think that's the Northwestern Depot, isn't it, uh, Doug? No, that looks like the earlier Great Western. Is yeah, it, North, it is. It's right North by Third Avenue. Was, yeah, Northwestern was two story. Okay, so. I'm sure. Yeah, that I remember that. Was, that was still there when I lived there. That was still there. That's a good picture of it. Yes, very good picture. It's another photo of it. Oh, yeah, you can see the old Great Western logo uh, mm -hmm. uh, between the side windows on the end. Yep. I don't know if anybody knew who Sebdi was, but he was quite a photographer, lived in Toledo, Iowa. And when he died, uh, they all went to his son. When he died, I purchased, uh, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 of these photos. The unfortunate part of it is, is he was a trader of photos. And we expected to see a lot of stuff from the area. He apparently traded that off. What we found was stuff from everywhere, <laughs> New York State, California. And I assume that he uh, traded an Iowa picture for one from sure. New York State. Yeah, I know I've seen his name on M and St. L photos. So, yeah, that's just. Ah, there's the uh, Orton Crane. Yes which I started to build and haven't yet. <laughs> Someday maybe I'll put that on and I'll show you where I'm at on the daily letter. <laughs> so now we'll slip over to uh, Gladbrook. That would be the line that came up from Tama, headed north. Mm-hmm. Here's a postcard of it. It would be the Great Western Station in Gladbrook. There seems to be three different depots on the Great Western in Gladbrook, and this is one of them. That, that is, I really like that picture because it shows the emblem and all, and not sure why that hopper is sitting there, but uh, anyway. And here is a different picture, which I assume is number two. That would be the Sprague replacement that they started doing in the late 40s. Yeah, I would have thought that would have been the last, but I'm going to show you another one that's it is the last. And there it is. I'm sure that's the last one they had. The cinder block replacement. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe they had a derailment that took out the Sprague one. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Well, wait a minute. Go go back uh, uh, one photo, uh, Ron, if you could. So their their train order signal was a, was a light, and uh, and that then if you go forward again, then they reverted to a semaphore. Yeah. Huh. Let, me, let me go back even further. Huh. See, that's a different kind of semaphore than any of them, or the, than the other oh. two. Uh -oh. Could that cinder block perhaps be a freight house or other structure instead of a depot? Yeah, I'm wondering. <laughs> I, I think the north end of it was the, or well, the other end of it was the depot. Okay. See, here's another picture of it. Oh, sure. Yep, They're actually, those are two different um, types of semaphores, yeah, two different right. two different sizes. You can well, see the blades are different. That's sitting on a poured concrete foundation. It's still got the metal ties sticking out. Yeah, of it. right. So I'm going to speculate the Sprague Depot was wiped out in a derailment that took the train order signal, and they just carried brought in one from another location yeah. instead of replacing. Hmm. Makes, makes a lot of sense. So this photo, this photo might be from the 70s. I would think it was a photo 
at the last one. I would think that would be the last people that was ever there. Yeah, definitely. I see oil tanks back here. Yep. I'm not sure where that's at. Well, it's it less listed as Gladbrook, but I don't know if it's east or west of Gladbrook. See the pilings for the old trestle that was through there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Oh my gosh. Yep. That's an Where early one the, showing the coal early shed. Early 1900s? Along. It yeah. could be that early. That's pretty early. <laughs> when you look at the cars, God, those are 20s. Mm hmm. Earlier, earlier yeah. even. <laughs> or, yep. Those oh, small that gondolas. <laughs> and, that... and you look at the double, uh, the horse uh, being drawn, double wagon in there. Yeah. That's oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Look, here, I hadn't really noticed that, but look at these. Yep. That you're talking yep. about. That says it's quite early. Mm hmm. And, and there's, there's not a motor. There's down. not. No vehicle, no motor vehicles. No motor vehicles. <laughs> look at None. look at look at the size of the car that's covered up by the words "bird's eye view." Mm -hmm. Pretty small. <laughs> yeah, wood oh, side. Those, those are all thirty-six foot cars. Yeah. And there's yeah. there, right a couple of horse-drawn wagons down in front of that gun, like they're unloading the yeah. gun, and yeah. unloading it. Sure. So. That's a photo you could study for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> this is also a, a interesting photo of a, 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 what do you call it, a wide angle view? Yep. That's yeah, a circuit, that's like a a circuit, circuit. picture. Okay. Ah. I took this picture now and I split it into a couple of, there. this is the same oh. picture. I just cut off part of it and enlarged it. That mm. may have been taken with a, um, uh, what do you call it? A um, a Kodak Panoram. There um, you go. Yeah. Be because it shows distortion in a circuit camera, doesn't show that type of distortion. You see this little building right here, this little white building? Mm -hmm. That looks like a woodland scenic building. Yeah. <laughs> perfect building for that. That's a barber shop, isn't it? Isn't that what you see? A uh, you look on the left side of it as you look at it, right near the window corner. On the left side, was oh, there a barber? Like... Uh, the barber pole is in the window. I think so. Oh, I bet it is. I think the you're looking at the barber shop. And and if and if you look real closely, you'll see men's magazines on the uh, on the <laughs> chair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the French postcards are in the back room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But you notice the here's the, the next here's the next part of it. The they overlap uh, a little bit. The coal sheds were both yeah. different style. Coal sheds. Well, yeah, they were. Look at all the horse wagons tied up. Yeah, there's no no motor vehicles. <laughs> no motor vehicle. <laughs> Must have been Saturday. They all came on to, into town to do their trading and sell the eggs. Oh yeah. They and, had and, water in town because here's the, the water tower. Yeah. Water, tower. water tower and and you could get gold metal flower mm -hmm. yep <laughs> is there an amish population out there not at that point yeah okay. not then no <laughs> and this is the right hand side of that view now uh, the northwestern railroad is up here yeah. dot pens pump post oh. yeah. pardon me Yep, Interesting elevators. And... Look at all the roofs. Look at all the uh, roof angles on the uh, elevator. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> they shipped a lot of cattle and hogs. You can see they have a, a windmill and yeah, for a uh, well, yeah. a yep. uh, covering there for the hog stuff like mm -hmm. that. Scale house on uh, the camera side of the stock pens, probably that probably. small building. Yep. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. Yeah, just wagon tracks. Mm -hmm. 
I would guess that this depot, I mean, elevator was on the Northwestern. Mm. Is that? Yeah. Is Northwestern yep. right? Yeah. I think so too. Yep. Spurs yep. off the Northwestern. You can see the signal mats down there as well. Yep. That's mm -hmm. off the Northwestern. Oh, that's pretty cool. And hardly any trees anywhere near the right of way. Oh, there isn't. So there's Green Mountain on the Great Western, which is west of, of uh, or east of Marshalltown. There is not much of Green Mountain out there. They, I'm surprised they had that large of a depot. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, if I, did I, Doug, am I right on what I said there? I believe you are, uh, but you know, Railroads built depots to impress townspeople and yep. townspeople insisted on railroads that would be impressive or depots that would be impressive. And I noticed well, the fellow's holding up a train order. He's got a stick there for holding up train orders. Yep. There's he wants a, to show his work from once in a while. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the, and the hand, hand card over there leaning up against the wall and the yeah. railway express agency sign there. That's yeah, a good mile markers on the on the station name there. Yeah. Yep. And some decorative roof detail. Look at the uh, look at the uh, corners of the yep. roof. Yep. That, that's unusual, actually, I think. Pretty fancy. Yeah. They look like little Viking ships. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in Norwegian territory. <laughs> and, and it's a speed photo. Yeah. <laughs> speed, yeah. Yadir. <laughs> We're gonna slip back to the northwestern at Cloutier. I thought this was an interesting picture with a burning. Uh, yeah, weed, weed burner. burner. <laughs> weed it's a Fairmont weed burner. Yep. Mm -hmm. I've actually seen one operate. It, yeah, I mean it's quite a deal. I've seen them. Uh, the the Milwaukee also did uh, oiling to uh, kill the weeds. That mm -hmm. was an awful mess because <laughs> I mean every place that was just you know. Get it on your shoes and everything else. <laughs> oh, how about the top of the telephone pole? Look at that weirdo. Oh, yeah. What is uh, it? Look at what's there. the box up there? Anybody ever seen this, something like that? Like in a signal or a birdhouse? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, 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 that's weird. That's, for, that's a screech owl box. <laughs> I'm going to guess a birdhouse. <laughs> Uh -huh. Looks like there's electrical going into it. Yeah, yeah I'm thinking it does. It's a, it does. <laughs> it's a it's a transformer. Keep the bird warm in the winter. <laughs> transformer. That's my guess. Oh, that's probably what it is. Yeah, but it Mom, looks it fun. looks square. It is. Right it is the old timey transformer. <laughs> and it's the old spike going up the tele uh, up the pole. Nope. Yeah, and look at the the outhouse there at the far yeah. end of the. Yeah, outdoor yep. plumbing for sure. <laughs> yep. Yeah, here's the uh, uh, outhouse. Mm -hmm. And there's a truck off to the far left. Yeah, yeah. it's just the tail yep. end. Of it. Yep. And you can see very narrow sidewalks right to the right of the end of that truck. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yep. Going up the street there. Yeah. Plutier is east of Tama and east of uh, uh, Gladstone, where I live. Yep, and it got flooded out often. I thought that was a pretty nice picture of a uh, stock train. Stock train. Yes. Looks like they're just coupling up onto the cars. I didn't, couldn't find where it was from. Uh, it could be out west. It could be a, an Iowa thing, but I would guess it's out west. Hmm. Yep, I would say so. They probably stored them out there, getting ready for the um, fall harv you know, fall season of move livestock season. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. They only have one A unit. Well, they're all empty. Yep. Yeah. Light, actually light. Yeah, if they're just collecting empty cars to start spotting them for loading. I used to talk to mechanics and they hated working on this type of unit. 
absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hmm. Terribly inside, crowded, hot. Yeah. I found this in the uh, part of the collection. I don't know if anybody needs it. I could send that on to somebody if they wanted to uh, build nice. one. Oh, sure. Clark will have it done by tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> come on. He can have it done by midnight. <laughs> come on, midnight. <laughs> hey, Clark? I, have, I have built several of the of the Westerfield kits. If, if this drawing is accurate, look at the, um, the grab iron ladder off to the right. Uh, some On some of it, the iron is below the, the bolts and yeah. on the Second yeah. from the top, it's above the bolts. Then it, the next one is below the bolts. Then yep. below mm -hmm. the bolts. And then the next one is above the bolts. That's so they could bolt it to a board. Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. They were done like that. Yeah, to keep the spacing even, and the boards were not all. Right. You know, ah. the boards are not all the same size, and the spacing mm -hmm. just. Yeah. Sure. But yeah, it's an interesting detail. I just want to slide ahead to some later, earlier, or not too late pictures. These all came from from Truman. Where uh, is where is, is Sheb? A, what what is the that a, is that a S H E B? That's what's on the photo. But what is is that just uh, what's missing there? The boy again. The boy again. Oh, wow. sure. Yeah, Truman worked at Sheboygan. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll correct that and put Sheboygan on there because I wasn't sure what it was. Yeah. There might be the line on the, on the right there going down to the power plant. I don't know. Looks like a string of coal hoppers. So yeah, yeah. You, I, yeah, unit train cars for, for the Sheboygan power plant. Mm -hmm. And I'm done. All right. Well, Doug, can you do yours in five minutes? I think so. All right. So we'll <laughs> see if we can. Oh, let's see. I'm looking for. Where did I put it? In the meantime, Dave, how were those wood grain doors secured to the inside of the box car? Nailed. Were they na nailed? nailed. Like a double, a double headed nail. Right, double headed. Like 16 penny nails or something? Yeah. If, oh, yeah. if, if, if you remember that, um, that um, uh, grain door kit, uh, it talked about you got so many pounds of double headed nails in, in your kit. Yeah. It's quite a Thank you. See it? Are you seeing that? It says Rock Island Lines on it? Not yet. Not nope. yet. Okay. Then something didn't work. Are you seeing anything now? Nope. nope. By the way, when you guys are saying double-headed nails, is that like what they used to, the staple type with the double point? No, oh, no, 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 no. It actually has two heads on it. Actually, a lot of those okay. in, I used a lot of those in doing form work, you know, well, they still do, you know. So you can get them out, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, right. They're usually you like 16 penny commons. All right. Three and a half inches long. You know. The rule of thumb is the nail should be twice as long as the thickness of the board you're nailing to something. So if you got a, well, say if it's one inch board, you need a. There we go, Doug. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, let me. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm not seeing it now. Let's. We are. <laughs> yeah, we. Well, what? They're all numbered. <laughs> ah, okay. One through six. Yeah. Are you oh, seeing it now? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, now change your display settings and swap monitors. Oh. What am I doing wrong here? 
up at the top where it says display settings just say swap oh yeah top left yeah yeah swap presenter there we go ah. yeah perfect now you can see it yep oh perfect okay yeah i've collected a few documents this is one the rock island published on as you see, empty boxcars coopering for grain loading. Um, and it gives some, uh, the, you know, what you need to do for things like, you know, the parts to be examined for flour, for cement, for grain, uh, for rough freight, the different types of requirements that were done. Some explanations about cleaning the floors. But here are some diagrams of, you know, they use piece of, you know, scraps piece of wood to cover big holes. And um, <laughs> for the the grain strips, where they would nail strips of wood over openings in in, in wood pieces, and then they would line the cars. Uh, they even used paper lining, or they, you know, you can see down here where they coopered the lower part of the car, or they're lining it completely with with heavy craft paper, as Dave mentioned, or or even thin cardboard sometimes. So. Um, here's some more photos of, of the coopering, the paper coopering. Um, you can see they run the paper up to the edge of the doorway, and then they've got the standard grain door nailed up in there. And the grain doors were were two pieces of one by nailed together offset mm -hmm. so that you had those panels. That's why they wide and, and narrow boards together. And then they had the cross, the end pieces to hold them all together. And you right. would have three or four of those grain doors nailed up, as you can see. Um, then some more instructions about, you know, inspecting the outside, the inside Cooper paper, 48 inches wide, instead of burlap, you know, stripping mm. cars a little with flour. And then you had locations on the Rock Island, the Coopering stations listed here. That's interesting. It's an interesting book and I'll be happy to send it. It's yeah. only about eight, 12 yeah. pages. I'd be happy to send it to anybody. That's really Now cool. here's another, this was a, a, paper that was sent out from the Rock Island on instructions for coopering. And here you can see again, the fellow down here, he's covering broken lining boards. He's covering holes in the floor. Uh, here's instructions for how to nail on the, the um, paper coverings and uh, nailing up the, uh, the paper grain doors. Hmm. Here's some more instruction. Here's how to nail in the wood grain doors. You use the 12 penny nail. Uh, you had to use a wood paper strip or wood lath secured with three penny nails for the paper doors. So, and a top pry board nailed to inside a barricade. So, and here again, the paper door, you had a wood strip that went across the top and the bottom and a, often they had a brace that was a metal, might be a metal brace or wood brace. And the later ones, they had these uh, bands of steel that went across the opening to keep the paper from pushing out. And they were nailed to the inside of the door. Now let's look at prototype photos. Um, we're talking about paper. Well, here's loads of paper, but notice the door seals hang in here um, on the edge of the door opening and along the bottom. Here we are nailing up a grain door. <laughs> uh, some have suggested that looks like Radar O'Reilly helping the official. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, no, why is the official it doing does. it? <laughs> <laughs> so now here, here's an interesting photo. This shows uh, a, a door that has had the one. exterior sealed mm -hmm. because that was to keep the dirt and the soot from blowing in around the door. And so they would they would do that. And that that would be if they had tape available, but you probably using lath strips to nail that right. paper all the way around to yep. seal that door. Yeah, last. It would also keep that now, brunette. One, it would also keep that brunette from getting in and stealing some of the uh, contents. Well, that that could be too. But in the days of steam, it was more to keep the cinders and soot and stuff mm -hmm. out. So mm -hmm. now here's a stock car that has been papered. You'll notice the doors covered on the outside, but the interior has been lined with paper. And they did this in harsh winter conditions ah. to keep the wind chill factor a little bit ah. less inside the car. And there are instructions to Cooper or paper the the car um, on the interior for mm -hmm. you know extreme harsh conditions. So especially for hogs, you notice that's a double deck car. 
Oh, yeah. Now, here's an interesting one. This shows a refrigerator car, an armor car that has had the door covered with paper. Um, again, it could be they had a door that was leaking and they wanted to seal it up correctly. So. Uh, that's an interesting photo. Is Yeah. Yeah, that's that's zoomed in a little bit. A lot of cement container, containers. Look at the gun right in front with the containers. Yeah, yeah, look at all the containers. So, yeah. Now here here is a several refrigerator cars. This is out in Utah in the '40s, and you'll see they got the doors completely papered over. Hmm. Uh, the first two cars there. So. Hmm. Now here here's another shot. Um, you can see the paper seals. Around the doors, you can see how the, with these uh, single sheath cars, the bracing on the outside, the door sits away from the wall of, of you know, the sidewall of the car. So they sealed that to keep stuff from blowing in. And here's another shot. Again, this is Utah in the 40s. You can see how that paper is, you can see the lath strips have been tacked up on the car side, holding that heavy paper in place. And yet another example. Hmm. And then here's the, this is a close-up of that refrigerator car with the whole door covered and a couple pieces of lath nailed in the middle of the paper to yeah. keep it from blowing away. That's so. pretty wide paper. Mm. You know, nobody does this in modeling, do they? No. No. It, this I never saw this many photos of this before. <laughs> I know. That's why I've collected these. It's really cool. Yeah. Eric, Eric is. Hansman is yeah. Eric Hansman, who models the late 20s, has been starting to play with using cigarette paper oh, yeah. after the door seals. Ah, hmm. yeah. So um yeah. Yeah. I'll go one, get some zigzag tonight. There you go. Yep. And here's <laughs> here's one final photo of a um steel box car with a paper grain door and they're getting ready to load it with grain. So and that that yeah. looks like about an eight foot door. Right. It, right. Yeah. The paper, that was one reason the paper doors became popular is the standard wood grain door board was seven feet long, which gave you six inches on either side of a six foot door opening. Uh, if they went to a seven foot or eight foot door, they had to double up the number of grain doors used and put a post in the middle. Uh, um, with the paper doors, they could accommodate the larger doors because you get the paper in either for a six foot door or seven foot or eight foot door. So, but you notice the, the fellow standing on the platform getting ready to climb climb in. But yep, so that's that's what I've got. So all Let's right. Well, thank you, Doug. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ron. We got to run. We got a meeting that's going on already. Okay. So appreciate everybody. We'll see you next week. Yep. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.